India is hardwired uh, from inception as an independent country to be what used to be called non-aligned and what India's foreign minister now calls multilateralism. Hello and welcome to the G Zero World podcast. This is where you'll find extended versions of my interviews on public television. I'm Ian Bremmer, and today we are taking a close look, a very close look at the U.S.-India relationship. Based on the pomp and circumstance surrounding Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's state visit to Washington in June, the answer seems obvious, right? They love us, we love them, end of story. Am I right? Well, it's complicated. India's government is not quite ready to hitch its star completely to our American wagon, and the United States has made it somewhat clear that it's not a fan of India's friendly ties to Russia and Iran. Add to that the increasing international scrutiny on India's eroding democratic norms, press freedom crackdowns, and religious persecutions, and the question becomes, is India a U.S. ally? And don't even ask the Indians about eroding U.S. political norms and institutions. <laughs> That's a whole other show. My guest today will do her best to answer. Barka Dutt is an award-winning Indian broadcast journalist and anchor with more than two decades of reporting experience. And she joins me now from London. The G Zero World podcast is brought to you by our lead sponsor, Prologis. Prologis helps businesses across the globe scale their supply chains with an expansive portfolio of logistics real estate and the only end-to-end -end solutions platform addressing the critical initiatives of global logistics today. Learn more at prologis.com. Barkadot, thanks so much for coming back to our show. It's a pleasure to be back, Ian. Thanks for having me. And a great time indeed on the back of your Prime Minister Narendra Modi's uh, trip to Washington. Um, a lot of people are saying in the United States this is the best bilateral uh, that Biden has had since he became president. Uh, what do you account for the dramatic improvement of U.S.-India relations? How much of it is China? How much of it is something else? I think a lot of it uh, is China, and a lot of it is also that in many ways this is India's moment. Uh, I think if I were to look at uh, why sort of uh, Narendra Modi was literally the showstopper at the White House, um, I would say there seems to be a great growing bipartisan anxiety in the United States uh, of America about China, about China's aggression, about China's encircling of the Indo-Pacific uh, region in particular, and there India and China's interests, strategic interests, converge. So that's one part of the story, certainly. The other part of the story is, is the galloping pace at which India's economy uh, is growing. Uh, despite all of the challenges that we face, uh, India is among the fastest growing economies in the world. The size of the Indian market, uh, the recent purchase, for instance, of the Boeing aircraft uh, by Air India, uh, to, uh, General Electric. The biggest Green. ever. Yeah. Biggest, biggest purchase ever. ever. Yeah. yeah. So, so, we're, so it's the size of our market. Uh, that's the second. Um, and the third, I think, um, and maybe we don't talk about this often enough, is the success of the nearly five million strong Indian American community in America, uh, you Absolutely. know, from Sundar, Absolutely. from Sundar Pichai to Mindy Kaling, Kamala Harris, referenced again and again by both Biden and Modi, um, uh, an example of the success story of this community. I think all of these are the things that work, they, they, you know, things have converged at this moment in time. China has a lot to do with it. Let's not kid ourselves. But there are some other things as well. Now, I, I want to talk mostly about India, but I do have to push back because you talked about China's encirclement of the Indo-Pacific. And I mean, at least if you look at military bases, it does feel like the Americans are doing the encircling. Is that fair? Well, maybe I should have used the word uh, a little more non-literally. I think what I'm trying to say is that China is throwing money at uh, at countries in in the region, yes. and in particular, Absolutely. in particular, uh, India's neighbors, uh, right? Um, and China is using infrastructure; it's weaponizing infrastructure. For example, building ports at very very strategic places. Uh, there is, of course, the One Belt One Road project of China. So I think when India looks 
at all of this, uh, India sees um, an aggressive China, a neo-imperialist China, China using both its access to markets as well as just the, the, the sheer resources it's throwing at these countries uh, to, 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 to grow its influence. So it's basically buying influence for money is the Indian perspective. And I know, know the Americans have multiple concerns about the rise of, uh, the rise of China, despite yes. uh, Antony Blinken trying to unsuccessfully thaw that relationship, right? Uh, so I guess... No, honestly, Blinken, you missed it. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's I, all mine. It's yeah, okay. that's a good one. But I think that's the I think that's the big convergence, <laughs> right? That's the big convergence. It doesn't actually yeah, mean yeah. I should say that India and the U.S. will uh, have identical responses to China. I should say yeah. I wrote in the post that listen, America, India is never going to be your ally in the way. That I know. You, I saw that. Yeah. I saw that. I was so sad. You said you called the Americans dear friends, but you said that India will never be an ally. Now, now I need to ask you. Yeah. I understand that India is an independent country. They make their own decisions. It's a big country. You're going to have good relations with lots of countries around the world. But when I think about allies, I think about strategic and military alignment. And what I see is that the Indians are not going to be able to buy military equipment from the Russians the way they used to for lots of reasons, not least of which the Russians won't be able to produce that quality and capacity and corruption and problems, all that. But then you've got the Chinese and you're not going to buy from the Chinese because you're concerned about chips and surveillance and all of that. Every other country's tiny. The Americans are now saying they're willing to provide serious technology for military companies to go down and, and build and develop that supply chain in India. The Americans outspend the next 10 countries in the world on defense. I mean, if India is going to get into bed with the Americans on defense and technology like that, doesn't that put India on a road to maybe becoming an American ally? Am I, am I really reading too much into that? I mean, never say never, but I don't see it happening. Um, I think uh, the, 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 the sort of outer limit of this relationship is going to be strategic cooperation. I don't at all deny the fact that India would like to stop uh, our dependency on the Russians um, to, to buy weapons. Uh, I think the General Electric deal to manufacture uh, engines for fighter jets in India is extremely critical. I think um, conversations around purchasing armed drones is extremely critical. So I see your point, Ian, that we, we as a country need to move away from the Russians and America is the obvious alternative. But will that translate into joining a security uh, slash military alliance? No. Um, India is hardwired uh, from inception as an independent country to be what used to be called non-aligned and what India's foreign minister now calls multilateralism. Now, you can push back and say, you know, what does that actually mean? Does it even mean anything? You've got to pick aside. The fact is the Indians right now have got, I want to say get away, but I don't know if that's the correct phrase, have managed to move from a meeting of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the SCO, right to a meeting of the Quad and, and, and not have really had to pay any consequences for it. So India is asserting her moment in time uh, for a variety of reasons. Every country plays to its own self-interest and India is doing the same. Now, there, there, there's not a lot of pushback on India's uh, democratic weaknesses right now from the United States, in part because India is having its moment, in part because the United States has its own challenges politically at home right now. But I did note that uh, Modi and Biden both decided to take questions, um, which is not something uh, that the prime minister does very often. Um, and, and he was pushed back specifically um, on issues of treatment of minorities. He denied the existence of discrimination based on race. Um, but it, I thought it was notable that he, was, that he actually was willing to comment on it at all in, in the context of the United States. Um, do you see any shift at all uh, inside India in terms of Modi's, what had been his particularly toxic uh, relationship with Muslim minorities? 
Um, as a matter of fact, the BJP, the ruling party uh, that Mr. Modi uh, leads, is trying uh, an outreach program uh, in the last few months in India's uh, most populous state of Uttar Pradesh with the Muslim community. In fact, a segment of the Muslim community that's known as the Pasmanda Muslims. And I'd be very intrigued uh, to see actually what comes out as a result of that. But uh, I want to say a couple of points about this democracy debate. Looking at that press meet where both Biden and Modi were asked about um, India's record on democracy and, and rights for minorities, I thought there were lessons for both sides. I think the lesson for the Modi government is you don't like this question. Uh, you get prickly about it. You think it's biased Western media stereotyping. But the, but the evidence tells you you can't ignore this question. So you have to find a way to engage with this question. You have to find a way to address this criticism if you think it's unfounded. You can't just say, uh, you know, I'm just going to evade this and this is an area I'm not going to go into because the op-eds and the questions and the journalists and even 70 lawmakers of America are going to bring it up with you. So don't evade the question. And, and by the way, Indian, my, my understanding, Bark, is that Indian journalists will bring it up too. Some Indian journalists will, not all. Some will and some do. <laughs> and, 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 and the yeah. point is it isn't going away. But... For critics of the Modi government in America, some in the Western media, some in, in, in the Democratic Party or maybe even among the Republicans, I would say that Indians, even those who do not vote for Modi, tend to close ranks if they think a Western power is being all judgy. Um, it may come from our history of being a colonized nation. It may come from us saying, hey, are 70 lawmakers in India's parliament going to write a letter to Modi saying, please remember to tell Biden about gun violence. Please remember to tell Biden about the, the abortion rights that women don't have. I guess the point I'm trying to make is their messages for both sides. For the critics in America, let India battle this out. It'll probably be more productive. Don't be judgy. Talk to us as an equal. For the Modi government, you can't hide from this question. You need to start engaging with it. It's a real question. And you have to engage with the criticism that is brought to your door on this question. I mean, Modi did say, of course, that um, democracy is in India's DNA. I understand it's a very useful talking point when addressing Congress. But, but how much do you think India's democracy as a set of values is actually essential to what Modi is trying to do, to the legacy he's trying to build? It's a very interesting question, and I may uh, sort of offer a counterintuitive answer because I speak uh, neither as a supporter nor a critic, but I would hope as a dispassionate observer, I believe that Modi's image to him in the world is important. I believe that the prime minister comes from a somewhat bruised history. Remember, this was the same leader who was once denied a visa by the Americans. In the United was, States, absolutely. Yeah, and not able to enter when he was Gujarat chief minister for nearly a decade. It matters to him to be seen as what in Hindi you know, we call Vishwa Guru, a leader of the world, a leader on the world stage. And, I, and therefore, I think it matters to him. And I think he also feels that the Western press stereotypes him, as does some of the liberal press in India. He's always believed that. But I think uh, that, that Modi's sense of his own legacy um, comes from actually winning elections. Modi is who he is and as powerful as he is because he wins elections. And, and the day that that... So, so in some ways, Modi's brand lies in democracy. Because, because he derives, he's not Putin. He hasn't made himself president and, you know, he's not Xi Jinping. He is the elected leader of a vibrant democracy. Yes, you can argue that what happens between elections, not at elections, I believe our elections are absolutely de democratic. And some might argue even more so than the American process where a section of the polity refuses to accept election results in the US. But in India, the concerns are what happens between elections. Is there a way of deepening democracy when it comes to a free press? Is there a way of deepening democracy when it comes to losing archaic laws like putting away people for sedition? Um, those, that's where we must focus. But I think Modi and his fans and his supporters cannot disassociate associate themselves from the democracy question because Prime Minister Modi is as powerful as he is because Indians vote for him. 
And it's not just that Indians vote for him, it's that his, the level, the extent of his popularity, I mean, at a time when established leaders are, are just getting destroyed across democracies all over the world, this is a guy that's not only consistently won, he's still at some 70, 75% approval ratings across almost 1.5 billion people. I mean, that by itself is a fairly staggering statement. Yeah, uh, his approval ratings have only improved. Uh, uh, you know, uh, some surveys suggest it's above 65 percent, others above seventy five percent. But they've oh, they've improved. He has not diminished uh, in personal popularity, though his party often has. And this is a very yeah. interesting situation because it's not that Modi doesn't lose elections. Modi loses state elections all the time. But when it comes to a national election, I think the real challenge for the opposition is that Mr. Modi has managed to pivot India's parliamentary democracy more modeled on the British system to a somewhat American presidential system where the individual is actually determining the outcome of a national election more than sort of the arithmetic of 500 plus seats. So I think that's that's where India um, that's where India is at. I would I would, of course, uh, sort of hope that that Mr. Modi's popularity is channeled. Uh, into engaging with some of these criticisms instead of seeing them as uh, sort of congenitally um, adverse to him, which is how uh, he perhaps because of his historically adverse relationship with sections of the media has always seen the media commentary on him. The big story that he had been making news for before this trip um, was the blow up of one of his major business supporters um, Mr. Adani, uh, and I, I wonder, um, has that implosion, one of the two most important business leaders in India, has that changed at all um, the way he thinks about the business community, about the need for transparency? Um, has, it, has it changed his model for Indian growth at all? Again, the, the economic results speak for themselves, but this was, this was a, a, a chippy few months uh, for India's perception uh, by the global markets. Yeah, uh, the Adani uh, Hindenburg saga did certainly grab um, sort of, you know, all the talking points for a few months. Uh, e even in media seemed to be uh, sort of partial to the government or government friendly media. You, it was too big a story to ignore. And that's the nature of news. No matter how much, you know, somebody sort of likes you, uh, when the news is that big, it becomes the news. Um, that said, I think for a lot of people, the ordinary Indian voter, it's too complicated to understand. So they understand it in some basic sort of rhetorical way. I'm not sure it's going to be the biggest issue uh, going into the next election. It seems to have already kind of fallen off the headlines. Um, but here's the interesting point. I mean, yes, I do think that there is some sort of uh, I want to use the word distancing, but I'm not sure. But we didn't see Gautam Adani being one of the business leaders who was present at the White House state dinner. So, I mean, I think maybe there's a kind of low key, uh, you know, it's just a sort of low key phase. I don't think uh, there's going to be anything maybe more significant than that. We have to see what our Securities Exchange Board inquiry report finally decides. But I actually look at Narendra Modi as a welfare capitalist. I don't see him, you know, the idea of him being this sort of center-right um, person on business. I just don't see that. I see, in fact, uh, Modi's big success coming from a lot of uh, welfare schemes, a lot of using technology to deliver uh, last mile subsidies. You know, during the pandemic, a free wheat and rice uh, were, were sent to people with, with bags that had the image of Narendra Modi and the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh, Adityanath, on them. Uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, other programs, you have other direct cash benefits, especially for women. You have a toilet scheme. So you do not have the state diminishing, you know, you don't have less state. Mr. Modi used to talk about less state, right, um, in business. But I don't think we have less state. We have a big state model. We have a big state model and, and, and the state um, is very is very, very hands-on and it's linked to actually Modi's political success in, in some ways. Yes, when it comes to big business, I wish for less and less uh, regulatory hurdles, because the more regulatory hurdles you have, the more government you have, and the more proximity business people feel to establish with politicians across parties. This is not unique to Mr. Modi. It, it was as you know, it was true yeah. even in the Congress time. Yeah. Um, 
But I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we're like, yes, Air India has been privatized. I, I think- mean, I, it sounds like he's insulated from the relations with these two massive, you know, one, one the way in the West, you'd consider them oligarchs. I mean, they're in every business. There's lots of corruption questions, all the rest. But fundamentally, that's not what drives the perception of Modi in terms of his economic policies and success. I would agree with that. And, and the opposition has tried to make these big issues, but they've never really worked at the hustings. Before we go, I mean, I do want to go back to what was, of course, the worst period that I remember uh, for India in a very, very long time uh, and a lot worse for you. Um, it was about two years ago when you were on the show and it was just in the depths of COVID and you had just lost your father. And I wondered before we close, if you could just tell us how you're doing uh, and also maybe a word or two on this book that you just wrote um, about that time um, in your life. Thank you for asking, Ian. Um, you know, you know it's, it's sort of a strange thing to go from being the chronicler of a story to becoming the sort of protagonist uh, and, and becoming the story that you've been reporting. And in some ways, uh, you know, I traveled across India during the pandemic and we had a shutdown of public transport. Um, and, and so I had to do it by road. And we're a big country. And I traveled from the north to the south and then not just did reports, but wrote a book basis that. And then, yes, in the middle of all that, I lost my father to COVID. Uh, it's been personally a very, very painful full time and professionally ironically some of my best work and 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 to reconcile that is 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 quite a difficult thing to do emotionally you know sometimes you feel haunted by guilt you know you feel like you could have done more for your father instead of um, more for the story it, it, and and I know it shouldn't be a choice at all and it wasn't but I was you know I I flew back to Delhi as soon as I heard but you have all that guilt that children have about their parents and so, well, I live with it by hunkering down and working even harder. I don't know any other way to do it. My father's ashes are in a rose plant at, at the back of my house in a little garden, and I like to feel he's there and he approves of what I'm doing. My book is based on the people uh, behind the headlines. I thought that there was a lot of data that was thrown around the world during the pandemic. So many millions, so many million, this dashboard, America, dashboard, India. But what happened to those people? What happened to children who died? What happened to, you know, single parents? What happened to graveyard keepers? What happened to those who had to burn the bodies? What happened to hope and despair coexisting? So it's called Humans of COVID. Um, it's, it's about, uh, it's about literally the people, the people of the pandemic. And I hope you get a chance uh, to read it, as do your viewers. No, I look forward to it, Barkin. You know, maybe you just owe your dad your best work, you know? That's what I try and tell myself. I think so. I think so. Look, thank you so much. It's always good to see you. I hope to see you in person soon. Thank you, Ian, and thanks for having me. That's it for today's edition of the G Zero World Podcast. Do you like what you heard? Of course you did. Well, why don't you check us out at g0media.com and take a moment to sign up for our newsletter. It's called G Zero Daily. The G Zero World Podcast is brought to you by our lead sponsor, Prologis. Prologis helps businesses across the globe scale their supply chains with an expansive portfolio of logistics real estate and the only end-to-end solutions platform addressing the critical initiatives of global logistics today. Learn more at prologis.com. You're listening to the G Zero World with Ian Bremmer podcast your weekly geopolitical deep dive into the world's biggest news stories, featuring in-depth conversations with global leaders and newsmakers. To get more of G-Zero's insights on global politics every morning, sign up for our free newsletter, G-Zero Daily, at gzeromedia.com.